know, this country is in serious trouble there. Mm-hmm. And oh yes, a, a serious trouble. We are we are heading towards financial and social and cultural bankruptcy. Mm-hmm. There's your conference today. There's a huge amount of excitement around this party, but there are also challenges too. So before we look ahead, can we just look back a little bit to the election campaign? Now, you saw how much the mainstream media want to destroy your party and destroy your candidates. As a result, Richard, you had to, I guess, throw people under the bus. Now, do you think that was the right thing to do? Because I would argue, having spoken to some of them, that there were some of those candidates who maybe had expressed something inartfully on social media 10 years ago but actually deserve to be stood by. And certainly some of the comments were no different to anything that I would have been saying on my GB News show or talk radio show in regards to the World Economic Forum and that sort of thing. So I worry about this concept of offence archaeology. And I worry sometimes that actually the response is to immediately distance yourself from these people rather than saying, no, we stand by this person. We maybe don't agree with one of the comments that this person made on social media 10 to five years ago. Do, do, you, do you see the point that I'm making? I do, but I'm very clear, Dan. I could see the moment months ago when the press started to look at our candidates. You know, I deliberately put the, na- the candidates' names on the website because I wanted to see the sort of scrutiny and, uh, that, uh, that would come. And look, the right to free speech is a critical part of the democracy, and I'll defend that. But that actually doesn't give you the right to stand for a political party that wants to get pro- make progress, that wants to get millions of people to vote for you. And, uh, you know, we, so th- there are two different things there. And I think we've, we've, we've got to be open and honest about that. And you cannot defend the indefensible if you're asking people to look at you as a serious, credible political party and to get millions of people, as I say, to vote for you. So... And I also wanted to to set a marker for everybody else to understand uh, where we we're at. And I don't resolve from that one iota. And we came under a huge amount of scrutiny. And look, some of, I mean, some of it is ridiculous. And if someone wrote or said something daft 15 years ago, I mean, you get a longer sentence for uh, you know, for sort of saying or writing the wrong thing that length than, than, than you get for for murder, frankly. But that was the that was the level of scrutiny that we were coming at from. Mm. But where are we coming at it from? From basically uh, some of the right wing press. I thought the Daily Mail's behaviour during the campaign. We knew it would be it would be rough, but I thought it was reprehensible. Oh, they were completely outrageous. But and 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 uh, I I believe I have information to believe that they were operating in cahoots with hate not hope. I'm so sorry. Hope, hope not, not hate, hate. Whatever they're called. The most uh, hateful charity correct. in all the world. Uh, Very uh, ironic. Uh, the boss of whom, by the way, uh, carried out the greatest act of misinformation mm-hmm. for which he's had no sanction yes. whatsoever. That's another example. Yes, exactly. He, he claimed, just in case people don't know, this is a guy called Nick Lowell's. He claimed that there were acid attacks taking place against Muslim women during the so-called riots. That directly resulted in violence yeah. on the streets. And, and- no arrest. No consequence because he's on their side. Correct. So we had that. And look, they, the, the media came in as hard. What they didn't say in the uh, the cause of even handedness, even handedness during the campaign was that the Green Party had to withdraw the whip from 10 candidates, mm-hmm. no less, during the campaign, which was more than we did. So. Oh, yeah. Uh, look, and and, and look, for, by the way, the ty- types of. Uh, actions that their candidates were calling on resulted in effectively the call for Israel to be destroyed. So, you know, literally uh, some of them, some of them calling for genocide too. absolutely uh, just totally two faced, bare faced, ridiculous bias from the media. So we had an onslaught. And yeah, of course, we made mistakes. Everybody does. We learn from them. That's why the actions of what's going on now in terms of taking it to the next level of, of professionalism, of vetting, of growth, of branches, 
is so important and I'm massively supportive of all the great work that's that's being done by the team on that. Okay, can, can I ask a very specific question though? Because I know a lot of my viewers will be wondering about this. So Tommy Robinson hosted the Uniting the Kingdom march and it was a very peaceful event and lots of folk went and actually lots of Reform UK supporters went. There was no trouble whatsoever. Are you saying that if you attended that Tommy Robinson Uniting the Kingdom march or maybe posted on X in support of that march that you would not be able to stand for Reform UK in the future? I haven't said that, but we have a list of entities that uh, if you've been a member of, then that would prevent you from being a member of Reform or Standing. We're very robust on that. We want nothing to do with Tommy Robinson. And we want to uh, aim to be the, a, a credible challenger, to be uh, the, next, the next governing party. And that requires a, uh, bluntly, a, le a, le a level of hard work, professionalism and, and credibility that uh, you know, we've never seen before from neither, you know, from a party outside the main two. So that's where we are. That's what we're doing. That's where we're going. And we're not going to be hijacked by anybody in that ambition because bluntly, you know, this country is in serious trouble down. Mm -hmm. And oh, yes. A serious trouble. We are we are heading towards financial and social and cultural bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. So we have to uh, we have to present present a, a a very clear, bold, reforming alternative. And we get that right. It's not easy. We'll continue to make mistakes, but if we keep learning from them, try not to make them again then I think we will gain more and more support as people see that the, the two main parties, their solutions uh, are, are completely wrong. And, and just specifically on that, mm -hmm. you know, my, my hunch is the next election, whenever it is, will be a combination of an immigration and a net zero election. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm right about the madness of net zero, the greatest financial acts of, of uh, lunacy, for this economy, then the energy bills won't be coming down. People's utility bills, heating bills, they won't be coming down. And we'll be less competitive as a nation. And everybody will say, what's this all about? And let me tell you, when you go to other high growth countries around the world, whether it's in Asia or whether it's in the Middle East, like uh, Abu Dhabi and, and uh, Dubai, the Emirates, those places, high growth, uh, the two words that, that bluntly are not mentioned, net zero. They're after growth. They're not focusing on, on cutting the nose off to spite their face. Uh, whereas we are under what I believe is the most dangerous man in Britain, Ed Miliband, yes. who I have uh, who I've came, come across robustly in the House of Commons a couple of times now, and we will continue to do so. Uh, I, I genuinely think that... Uh, yeah, he's plans, floating under the radar well, while I'm, I'm, literally I'm, bankrupting us. Yeah, he, I think he's. A, I think he's in our very faces, uh, bankrupting us. I have to say, uh, it makes me makes my blood pressure go up when I'm sitting in the chamber and he's there ranting on. And for a very, very, very few of us, it's really only reform who have stood up in that chamber and challenged them on mm. this madness. I've challenged them twice now on steel. The fact that thousands of good steel jobs. Uh, and communities, those jobs are being sacrificed on the altar of this religion of net zero. And it's it's a catastrophe, an absolute disaster for, for them, for their families, their children, their communities, and our reliance on the ability to produce the strongest virgin primary steel. But that's yep. a, no, as, it it's actually as, as much the fault of the Tories as it is the Labour Party. Well, no, it is. And, you know, I call it nut zero. And I completely agree that at some point this is going to be a huge issue for your party, because if you look at the conservative leadership candidates, not one of them has had the balls to actually say no to nut zero. 
they have tried to say, oh, we maybe we'll do it in a safer way. No, no, no. You've just got to say no, which is something that Reform UK has done. Uh, just one other issue looking back, Richard. I want to clear up the whole Nigel Farage becoming leader situation. Now, I've always been very clear and said publicly that you wanted Nigel to be leader because that is always what you'd told me, quite frankly. You'd always been very open about the fact that you were desperate to bring him onto the campaign. But you know that there is this narrative out there that Nigel in some way ambushed you during the campaign and you weren't aware with what was going on. So do you just want to clear it up once and for all what yeah, actually, actually I mean, happened? The likes of Andrew Pearce in the Daily Mail wrote a complete load of tripe, balderdash and garbage as part of the Mail's campaign to smear us. And frankly, what he wrote was, was just pure lie. But it was actually for months and months, literally. I mean, since the back end of last year, when Nigel came back from I'm a Celebrity, I'd been answering every question about what, you know, what Nigel wanted to do. I said, look, the more help he can give, the better. And I'd been urging him to come back. And I was delighted when, uh, you know, when he, he, he sort of made that crucial decision. And only he could make that decision. All of it around work. We're urging, but the fact that having made that decision within a week, he'd had milkshake acid thrown at him. He'd had a, a concrete block mm -hmm. thrown at him. Mm -hmm. That proved why it was such a difficult decision for Nigel to make because it was a life-changing decision, and he, you know, wanted to, to make sure. And we, you know, the, the reality is, we were all ready to roll. And it's, it's one of the reasons I'm convinced, we're convinced that uh, Sunak called the election to everyone's surprise early, because he heard that Nigel was coming back. And that's, in a, in a sense, uh, if they had waited later, then Nigel would have come back in the summer, as, as we'd agreed and I, as I wanted, then we'd have had a longer run up along the runway and we'd have secured a lot more votes and we'd have got more seats. So that's that's crystal clear. So I hope that clarifies it. Um, and yeah, there's a whole load of nonsense written about that. But I, you just go back through the, the media things. I've said for many months uh, that the more help Nigel can give in whatever capacity, excellent. And He's committed to this now, right? This is a five-year project. He's not going to decide halfway through, oh, actually, I want to go and you know, launch a TV show in America or help Trump if he wins the White House, he's 100% committed? Oh, I think I think 300%. And that's why it's such a big decision. Because, as you can imagine, that's that's what I wanted to know. It's what everybody wanted to know, was that was that he was, he was wanted to do it for the long term. And, and he's made that very clear to everybody, which is fantastic. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it is, as I said, it's a life-changing commitment that he's made. And that's why, in a sense, all of, all of our jobs at Reform is to, is to back that commitment by work, working our absolute socks off to, to try to make him Prime Minister whenever the election is called in 28, 29. Do you think Nigel deserves or needs more security protection? given what happened to Trump and given the very obvious target that the left have put on his back? Yeah, security is a massive issue for Nigel. I suspect he's probably, uh, the, apart from the, the Prime Minister, or possibly even more than the Prime Minister, you know, he's one of the most exposed individuals in the country. So, yeah, security is a big concern. We obviously don't talk about uh, the operational details behind that, but it's, look, it's just... A, it's a sad fact of, of life for someone uh, so well-known, so high uh, profile, uh, but indeed equally for, for all MPs. You know, security is taken very seriously. The parliamentary authorities are, are really robust and brilliant about the, uh, the standards and procedures and recommendations that they have. Uh, it's, we are where we are, and it's, it's a difficult place particularly actually for female MPs. Mm. I think it's, uh, there's an added level of... Uh, of peril, of, indeed. Of, of peril and brutality, yeah. Indeed. Now, look, you know that I have been incredibly impressed with Reform UK since the election, but I am a critical friend, Richard, and so I have to ask you 
about something that I thought was really mishandled. And you would be, I think, surprised to know how many of my viewers were absolutely distraught about this decision, and especially the treatment of a man who had been incredibly loyal to you as deputy leader of Reform UK. I'm talking about the sacking of Ben Habib, which was done brutally and done without communication. It seemed to me that Nigel was very unhappy with his comments to Julia Hartley Brewer on talk about leaving illegal migrants to drown in the channel. But, but wasn't there a better way to do this with Ben? Wasn't there a way where he could have still taken on some sort of role in the party, that he still could have had a speaking spot at the conference? I mean, this is a, I mean, you know, he was your deputy. You chose him to be your deputy. He is an acutely intelligent man. First, though. It's the best time of year. Football's back. We're talking Premier League in the UK and in the US NFL Sundays and college football Saturdays. With that comes the glorious grind of fantasy football lineups. So this is where your owner manager comes alive, setting the perfect fantasy roster, screaming at your TV and making last minute waiver moves that either make you a hero or the guy everyone ridicules in the group chat. But listen, while you're over here making sure your fantasy team is dialed in, don't let your personal grooming become the guy that gets left on the bench. Let's be honest, nobody wants to fumble their grooming routine. So that's where Manscaped's Performance Package 5.0 Ultra comes in, acting as your all-in-one grooming playbook. From keeping things sharp down below with the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra to taking care of those rogue ear and nose hairs with the Weed Whacker 2.0, this is the lineup that will help keep you looking and feeling like a champ on and off the field. It will help you feel clean, confident and ready to dominate your fantasy league. The Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra Groin and Body Hair Trimmer is the franchise player of your grooming roster. With precise trimming capabilities, it's reliable, efficient, and gets the job done without fumbling. Whether it's for date night, a weekend tailgate, or just everyday grooming, this is the tool you want on your squad. Now, no one wants a surprise ear or nose hair making a guest appearance on game day, so the Weed Whacker 2.0 handles those details like a pro, keeping you neat and ready to go. No missed tackles in your grooming gang. And today, two free gifts. If you buy the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, the Boxers 2.0 Midnight Bravo, and the Shed 2.0 Toiletry Bag, premium gear to ensure you're always ready for action, whether at home or on the road. So join the over 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped and get ready for kickoff by heading over to manscaped.com. Use the code OUTSPOKEN today at checkout and you get 20% off and free shipping. Trust me, you'll be drafting the real MVP of grooming this season. So let me repeat, www.manscaped.com. Use the code OUTSPOKEN at checkout and you will get 20% off. Stay on top of your grooming game and be ready for anything the season throws your way. But now, back to the show. Yeah, look, um, there's no question that that interview with Julia was... It, it, Julia did a very good interview. She did a good job, and it was challenging. But actually, what he, what he really meant was, was mm. uh, completely misrepresented, mm -hmm. and, and I defended that. And our policy has always been crystal clear, pick up and take back. It's the only policy that, uh, that will work. Look... Things things change. Obviously, when uh, when we had now had people in Parliament, it was right to, uh, to, to to change things. We had to, you know, this this ambition to professionalise. And you know, I couldn't do everything. Nigel can't do everything. So, and, and when you're in Parliament, you sort of need a deputy leader. So, look, um, we made some changes. Whether whether pick different people and things, whether we get communication perfect every time. Well, you know, we can we can all sort of debate that. But look. Ben is, uh, he's, he's worked incredibly hard. He's very committed. He's a good friend. And uh, we, 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 all, we all move forward. And uh, I hope that he will continue to uh, remain very committed as, as much as he can. But we, you know, he's got business interests to pursue as well. And in a sense, you know, that level of commitment, it, it impacts on mm. some of one's outside interests. And that is also a, uh, a fact. But uh, no, look, the truth is, senior people in reform uh, have got a lot of a lot of personal support. Ben's got a lot. Rupert's got a lot. Lee's got a lot. I think I've got some, and Nigel's got a lot, and and, and uh, David Burl and, and various others. Yes. And, and you've got we, this new rising star who no one, James, who no one even expected to 
to, to make it, Parliament it, it, at all. Of, that, that's right. And, and, and sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, Zia's as chairman Zia, yes, yes, has yes. got a, uh, a you know a growing amount of support, and massive respect for the time and effort. Yeah, he's I think committing, he's good. which is which is huge. And uh, yeah, so more and more people are, are are listening and hearing and reading and watching what Zia writes and says. And that's just we, we just push on. And okay. uh, that's that's how we have to do it. You raised female MPs and their security earlier. There is a gaping hole. You know I don't do identity politics ever, Richard. But for me, there are two really obvious people that could really help Reform UK overnight. Two former Home Secretaries, uh, Priti Patel, Swala Braverman. Actually, the fact that are diverse women, I would say, is completely beside the point. But you need them in Reform UK, don't you? That they're born for your party, and they've been completely rejected by the left-wing Tories. Well, well as you say, uh, Dan, we don't do identity politics. We want great people, and but they're great people, people, aren't they? I mean, they're great people. They are great people, and uh, we 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 have a laugh in Parliament, and we tease each other, and uh, that's uh, that's sort of part of it. And indeed, I can be. Uh, Tease and be civil uh, outside the chamber mm. with uh, with people from the Labour yeah. Party. But, but I mean, are but, you but having with, active with talks with Conservatives? Yeah, look, um, lots of people ask me that, Dan, and uh, my my answer is the same. It's it's a fairly sort of uh, standard answer, but I'm not giving a running commentary on any yeah. chats, texts, telegrams, WhatsApps, mm. signal messages, or text messages, <laughs> or anything that I have with anybody because it's vital that. Yeah. As and when someone does want to talk, then they know that... That it's a confidential process. No, I understand. It's absolutely okay, okay. paramount. Let, let me ask in a different way. They're not about individuals. Do you expect the Reform UK caucus to be bigger than five MPs before the next election? 110%. About 200%. Because the thing uh, is, these I've... Conservatives surely have to realise... And by the way, I've said this to Suala and Pretty and about Suala and Pretty. I predict they will not win their seat if they stand under the Conservative banner at the next election. So there's also a degree of self-preservation, isn't there? Well, look, uh, we will definitely have more than five MPs by the time of the next election, whether it's by-elections, whether it's uh, people realising that we're actually the home of common sense from, uh, from the Conservatives or whatever. And uh, the more the merrier, we've just got to push on and just keep doing... Uh, what we're doing and, and and keep bashing on, but in a sense, you know, we, we we we're focused on what we're doing, candidly. And if we if we keep if we get it right, get the policies right, make enough noise, then I think I think more people will join us. Yeah. And well, in a matter of weeks, people will join us. There's also there's another, there are various people, for example, Dan, who just lost their seat. Yeah. High profile mm -hmm. conservatives who I think also are. Analyze, you know, thinking about uh, thinking about things very carefully, and uh, so let's wait and see. But Nigel has, has said before and, and continues to say something's going to happen on the right of centre of British politics. There'll be there'll be some shape of, of realignment in some shape or form of of that. We've got no doubt. Well, that's my final question, actually, Richard, and arguably it's the most important. Are you open? to some sort of arrangement with the Conservative Party. Now, I know you don't know who their leader is going to be yet, but is there a possibility, I'm not even talking about a full merge, but is there a possibility of some sort of electoral pact, some sort of deal where maybe you stand down in seats that are uh, where the Lib Dems are challenging the Tories, they allow you to be unleashed on the red wall. I mean, is there some sort of pact or are you still going down this path of the only way to victory is full destruction of the Conservative Party? What we're doing is just focusing on uh, on our own growth, our own branches. We've got a lot of work to do. And let's not get ahead of ourselves. The next election is, is four and a half, five mm -hmm. years away. So there's plenty of time. Who knows what happens when? And I, I, my... My main prediction is that whoever wins the Conservative leadership will most unlikely be the leader at the time of the next general election. I think that's sort of... <laughs> that's uh, guarantee, I think. That's just, I think. And, and the, the thing is, look, at the end of the day, uh, we want people 
with us who who believe in the philosophy mm-hmm. of conservatism. The Conservative Party does not own that philosophy. In fact, the truth is they abandon that philosophy, and that's why they're in the pickle they're in. So, and competition's a good thing. It's actually part of the Conservative philosophy. And if that makes us all perform better, well, so much the uh, so much the better. And so. But we just push on. I'm, I'm really not that fussed about what they're up to. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what I, I do I d- know is what I do know is you can't trust what these leadership candidates say. I mean, take Kemi Badenoch, Badenoch for example. It, when she was a minister, was she expressing concerns about China or the ECHR? No. Nope. Or, or net zero? No, nope. not at all. All of a sudden, now that she's out of power, she's trying to be a hawk on these issues. And, and I'm sorry, I just. I just can't trust people that operate like that. It uh, it doesn't sit well with me. We've got a very strong conviction on some very clear policies, and uh, we take some flack for it, but we are convinced that we're right on it. Well, yeah, and as I always say these days, Richard, Margaret Thatcher would now be considered too far right for the Conservative Party, and she would probably be a member of Reform UK. So I think you're completely right. The whole idea of what conservatism is is changing i think you've made a massive impact personally in a very short space of time it's like you've been unleashed actually i think maybe it's better for you being (laughs) deputy because you've got more time to focus on these issues that really really matter and i appreciate the time today and good luck at your conference tonight thank you very much it'll be it's a great event huge absolutely huge yeah i'm going to be tuning in thank you richard Thank you so much for watching Dan Wilson Outspoken. Please do subscribe if you want lots more clips and interviews like that. Plus, if you want to watch our totally uncensored after show, then visit www.outspoken.live.